listen a little while tonight. I'll try not to be extra long, but my sermon is a little longer. It's going to take longer to do what I'm doing here. But in these prophetic times, we need to look at some things from the Word of God. How many of you agree that we're in a very, very important time in history? These are definitely prophetic times. In other words, prophecy is being fulfilled right now as we sit here. Do you believe that? Yes, so prophecy is being fulfilled. So in the light of uh, recent attacks on Israel, October the 7th, approximately 6.30 a.m., by the Hamas terrorists located in the Gaza Strip. We will interrupt our series in 2 Corinthians to talk about that. These events are too important for me to overlook. In other words, I can say, okay, they're not happening. We're just going to stay with 2 Corinthians and move right along as if nothing out there ever happened. Well, folks, this is important to the church. How many of you believe this, these events are important to Good News Baptist Church? Absolutely, it's important. So it says in Titus 2, 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, righteously and godly in this present world. And here's the thing I want us to center in on, and I underlined it, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ought to be looking for Jesus to come. Amen? Amen? Every single one of us. Now, could he come at any moment? We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. The church of Jesus Christ called saints by the Holy Spirit are to be actively, I mean, not just whimsically or uh, second thoughts, we should be actively looking for the return of Christ. Of course, we all know this is not news to you, but by the way, some people do not know the things that I'm going to cover. How many realize that we don't just preach here, we're preaching on YouTube to people that may not know some things? How many of you understand that? On YouTube, we have over 300 subscribers. You say, preacher, are you really bragging about that? No, because other people have a million. So I'm not bragging about it. I'm just saying, well, there are other people that are going to hear what we're trying to say tonight. And do they need to hear the truth? Do they need to hear the truth? Yes, sir. Amen. <coughs> of course, we know that Jesus will come first in the rapture. <coughs> this coming will not be to earth but in the skies where he will call up the dead in Christ first and then those which are alive second, where they will meet together as one body of Christ also called the bride of Christ. This meeting of the bride with the bridegroom is imminent. Now that means soon coming. <coughs> imminent means that he could come at any moment. There are no signs right now needed for the rapture to take place. The Lord could come in the rapture, no signs involved. I will say more about that. However, Jesus will come seven years after the rapture to set up his kingdom. And that second coming of Christ will be associated with many signs. And some of those signs that will precede the second coming of Christ will begin before the rapture of the church. And so the signs of the second coming can also help us realize that the rapture could be at any moment. <coughs> First Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The word rapture comes from the phrase caught up 
which is translated from the word, Latin word, rapturo. And it is found in the Latin version of the New Testament, which was a common Bible for over 1,000 years from 382 AD in Western Rome, which was used by the Waldensians, I've mentioned that before, forerunners of the Baptist churches. The word rapturo to them meant caught up or to snatch away. The rapture of the bride of Christ or the snatching up or the catching away as it is translated in the King James, could take place any moment. Do you believe that? Yes, sir. The rapture could take place right now. There's no doubt about it. As these events unfold in Israel, many people are going to start thinking about prophecy, and you're going to hear a lot of prophetic messages on prophecy. But I want you to know something. Some people will skip the rapture and go straight to the second coming. And there'll be a lot of erroneous doctrine taught in the coming days. We need to be clear about what the Bible says about the return of the Lord. So the rapture could come at any moment. <clears throat> the rapture of the bride of Christ is like the wedding of the Eastern culture in antiquity. We studied that wedding, the Jewish wedding, and also the weddings of the uh, far Eastern countries. And we simply see the bridegroom getting his uh, home ready or his house ready and getting his friends. And when he gets the place ready, he takes his friends and with torches in the nighttime, they arrive at the bride's house and surprise the bride. She doesn't know when he's coming. So the bride has to be always ready in those, in that ancient culture, always ready. No, she didn't know when he was coming. She was betrothed to him. She knew that he was her husband to be, but she never knew when it was coming until those torches came down the road and the bridegroom was coming with those friends. And then she knew that the marriage was going to take place. So this is in any moment. Here's the bride of Christ. We are the church, the bride of Christ. Everybody knows that or should know it. And we should be ready for the Lord to come at any moment. The Bible tells us that. <clears throat> In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus has prepared mansions for us or is preparing mansion for us, and he could be through with that preparation any time. He could say, I'm done, and the father could say, go get your bride. Wouldn't that be wonderful if he came tonight and solved all the world's problems? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Take care of everything. So I'm looking for Jesus to come. Of course, we know that the tribulation has got to take place after the rapture. I am not talking much about the tribulation here, but after the rapture, seven years of tribulation. And I'm not talking about the Antichrist tonight and all those different things, but that's another time. <clears throat> he literally, Jesus Christ, comes to earth later after the uh, tribulation in, on the earth, not like in the air at the rapture. <clears throat> The events of this past week, October 2 through 7, draw special attention to this soon return of Christ. There are going to be many people. Do you remember when 9-11 happened, all of a sudden people got really interested in the return of the Lord? They came back to church for a little while, maybe six months or so. But, I mean, all of a sudden people were talking about the end times, the end times. By the way, this thing over in Israel is going to get a lot of attention from the uh, pulpits of America. But Jesus is coming again in the rapture first and then in the second coming seven years later. And those signs that go before the second coming of Christ will some way be evident before that. So here we have... And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars... Is that right? Are we hearing of wars and rumors of wars? Yes or no? Yes, we are. And by the way, just the Hamas and the Gaza Strip, that's not all. They're, they're looking at Lebanon and uh, so on. They're looking at 
Syria. They're looking at Turkey. Uh, so Israel now is being surrounded on the land side anyway. And can I tell you something? Eventually, I'm not sure when I'll get to it, but eventually I'm going to show you the three, I think it's three, different scenarios that are mentioned in the Bible about the invasion of Israel. But not tonight. It says, You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. And this is one of the reasons I want to preach this message tonight to you all and to others is that we ought not to be upset or troubled or scared. Amen. Jesus has got all this under control. God's got all this under control. Amen. And we don't need to be fretting about it and worrying about it and chewing our fingernails and things like that. Amen. That we don't need to fear. And he says, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation. Is that true? Amen. And kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, I know you've heard these signs before, but those things have been happening. They've been happening. And they're increasing, by the way. So these things will be observed before the rapture even. They'll be observed before the coming of the Lord a second time, but they will begin to grow in prominence before the rapture. They will be evidenced as something is happening, not just on earth, but in heaven. The war of Hamas against Israel is, can I tell you something? Listen, the war of Hamas against Israel is a sign that Jesus is coming. Do you? You say, preacher, I don't know about that. Folks, wars and rumors of wars, that's a sign. So this is a sign. What we have this week is a sign that Jesus is coming. Or if it was last week, whatever it was. <clears throat> and other signs will be observed well before the rapture of the bride. Believers, as well as all people, should be made aware, and this is what I want to do. I want to make everybody aware, lost and saved. It doesn't matter who. Whoever hears or listens to this, I want to make sure everybody understands the coming of Christ and the rapture could happen right now. And it is my duty to tell people that that could take place. It is imminent. That means impending. That means possible, approaching, coming around the corner, or soon coming at this moment. Now, if the coming of Christ in the second coming is possible at any moment, then the rapture of the church is even more imminent. You say, what does that mean? Well, if the return of Christ could happen at any moment, and there are signs that precede it. But if it could happen at any moment, then the rapture of the church could be any time. I mean, it's just that close. I am satisfied we are close to the rapture. That's what I'm satisfied of. You say nobody knows the day or the hour nor the time or the season. That's exactly right. But we see the signs are already evident. So... <clears throat> Which this thing would do. There we go. First Corinthians fifteen fifty two. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So that is speaking of the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church can take place at any moment. You say you've said that several times. I'm emphasizing it. The rapture could take place at any moment. Amen. The Bible clearly tells us to be ready for his coming. Luke 12, 40, be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when ye think not. So a lot of people are going to say this. All oh, people have been saying that all the time, preacher. That's exactly when he'll come. That's exactly when he'll come. Being ready for the return of Christ in the rapture includes discernment of the times. Includes discernment of the times. Let's look at some first things first. Now, pay attention. This is a little, oop, back up. This thing is really quick sometimes. and Sometimes it's really slow. So it fooled me. Here's the geology or the map of Israel. Now, I've never tried this pointer, but I'll try to point. Okay, it works. You see this right here? 
You can't read it, but that's the Golan Heights. Everybody see it? That has always been a problem. It's in Syria. There's Syria right here. That has always been a area of discontent, the Golan Heights. So that's in the north of Israel, and it's over in Syria on the Syrian side. So there you see the Sea of Galilee right here, right there. <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot of uh, all these other things I'd like to talk about, but you see the Jordan River running right down through here to the Dead Sea. And then you see this area. How many of you can see that area I just outlined? You see it? That's the West Bank. And that West Bank has caused all kinds of problems. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. Just wait till we get there, I guess. But anyway, you see in the West Bank, right there's Jerusalem, right on the edge of it. And there's Jericho. And there's Bethlehem and so on. And way back up there is some of these other towns that we've, Samaria is right here. And so there you have a, a, an idea of Israel. There, it's not a real big place. I don't know exactly the land mass. I didn't look that up. But it's not a, a very big place at all. And then look right here. This is what's happening right now. That's Gaza. That's the Gaza Strip. On the southernmost border, not southernmost, here's the southernmost border down there on that little finger that comes up close to the Suez Canal, but it's on the other side. But anyway, here is Gaza, right here. And this line is where we have the battle being drawn right now. There's Lebanon up here, and they've got another group that are, they've launched a missile from Lebanon just this week. Don't forget about that. And so we have Jordan over here, and, all, and Egypt down here, and Egypt wanting to send aid and uh, so is another country. I forgot which country. But anyway, the Israelis said, if you send a convoy for food and water, we're going to destroy it. You say, preacher, what's happening? All these insurgents, all these rebels, all these terrorists right here, Israel's going to take care of them. But God is still in control. You say, preacher, what does that mean? I'll, let's go through some more things right here and see what we've got here. <clears throat> So we have uh, the Golan Heights I mentioned. We have Turkey. I don't say uh, here. I don't know where if you can see this, but Turkey is up here. And I think uh, Iraq is right over here. You got to remember all these different places where you go and so on. So that you remember where all these different Turkey's direct north. Russia's on up further, but Turkey's right up there. So don't forget about that. Turkey is involved. How many of you know Turkey's involved in all this? Erdogan, he's right in the middle of this. Iran is financing, and Iran is over further over here. Iraq, Iran, and Iran is financing all this stuff. And you know this, this is on the news. But I'm telling you, the forces of evil are all around Israel. How many of you understand that's what I'm trying to show you? The forces of evil are all around Israel. So let's go to the next slide if I can work this thing. Okay. Now here's the Gaza Strip, and this is where all this conflict is taking place right here. It's identified historically as, look at this, that's the historical name, Philistia. This is the place of the old Philistines. Now you know about the Philistines. You know that uh, David was fighting the Philistines. You know Saul fought the Philistines. You know... Solomon had to subdue the Philistines. The Philistines have been an enemy for years and years and years and, the, and so on. We'll talk about that too. So now we want to look at these people for just a minute of this place right here called Philistia in the past. These people claim to be a nation, but they live all around in Israel and outside of Israel. You'd be surprised, but they have many of them live in Israel. We had a guide when we was in the Holy Land in 1980, and our guide was a Palestinian. And he was very quiet when we went by a big building with no windows. It was a two or three story building, no windows in it. And he finally said he got really quiet. And he finally said kind of to himself, and my dad was an hour right there close, and he said, that's where our leaders are. He's talking about the Palestinian leaders. Uh, these people claim to be a nation, but they have not been recognized as a nation. 
I want to ask you a question. Why has there never been a land area called uh, Philistia or Palestine or something like that? You say, well, this whole area that I showed you before, that whole area was called Palestine at one time. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. So we'll go back into history. There never has been a nation or land of Palestine. So how did it get its name? Where did it come from? In 1150 B.C., a broad area which was identified with the Philistines was called Peleset by the Egyptians and Palashan by the Assyrians. But no boundaries are given by either. The term Palestine first appeared in the 5th century B.C. when the ancient Greek historian Herodias wrote of the district of, Syrian, of Syria called Palestine between Phoenicia and Egypt. So Herodias wrote about it, but it was in Syria. It was a place or a district in Syria. In the early 2nd century C, uh, Christian era, the term Syria Palestinia, really the Palestinian Syria, was given to the Roman province of Judea. Now let me tell you why the Romans. The Romans gave this area the name Palestinia. Why? Why did the Romans call this area of the where we call Israel and uh Syria and Jordan and those areas, Lebanon. Why did they call it Palestine, Palestinia? Why did they call it that? The Jews had revolted against the Roman government. And when they revolted against the Roman government, the Roman army came in and squashed the rebellion. And to make the Jews smart, I mean to chafe under this rebellious attitude that they had to revolt against the Roman government, they called the place on purpose something that they despised. They despised the term Palestine or the name used for the old Philistine. They despised that name. So the Roman government gave them a name that they knew they would hate. And they called the whole area of that Jerusalem, all of Israel, all of Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and all of that. They call it Palestine to get back at the Romans for their revolt. That revolt was called the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135. <clears throat> so these, uh, there never had been a country by the name of Palestine, just a general area given a name. You say, preacher, why are you telling us this? Because these people say, we deserve this land, we deserve this country. By the way, you and I both know that in the Bible there are borders given for Israel. How many of you know God gave the land to Israel? And those borders go all the way up to the Euphrates and all the way down to the Nile. That's a big spot of land. And it, so does Israel have all that land from the Euphrates down to the Nile? Absolutely not. They don't have it at all. So <clears throat> these people were just the people from the area. They were non-Jews. They were from these areas. Arabs, if you please, but they were non-Jews from the north, south, east, and west, and they came to be known as Palestinians. But they lived within the respective countries of Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, and so on. So here's another. Come on, man. There you go. Wow, look at that. All right. I don't know if you can see this map, but I copied this on purpose. But here is the boundary of Syria, Palestine. This is made by the Balfour, um, um, Balfour, uh, I'm not saying convention, but it's a, like a, uh, an agreement. So it's, these are called armistice or ceasefire lines, actual borders in 1949. So these are not borders. The purpose I'm bringing this out is they were not borders. These are just armistice lines or ceasefire lines. And look how conflicting they are. Look at this. This right here, the solid green right here, is the boundary that they gave, or armistice, not boundary, armistice line for Syria, Palestinia. Now look at that. There's Gaza right there. So they said this is the Syria, Palestinia armistice line, ceasefire right there. And then the dotted green is the boundary between, they divided Palestine into the prima, 
and the secunda and so on. So the, the dotted line is another line giving us a, another part of Palestinian. And then the red line, the borders of mandatory Palestine, here they go, all the way down to that tip down there next to the Suez Canal, and then back up to Gaza Strip, back there. And this is the little, see that little light blue lines? Watch this. Here's what they said to Israel. You see Israel? This is Israel, right? All this little spaces in between here we would call Israel. You say, this is a ceasefire line right here at the Gaza Strip. And here's another ceasefire line. This is the West Bank. So Israel's sitting right here. There's Jerusalem right there. And they got all this stuff around them that says, you can't fire, you can't do anything. By the way, what if the Palestinians fire? What's Israel supposed to do? You know what they do? They fire back. Wouldn't you? So here's, it's supposed to be a ceasefire in all these areas, but they don't do it. All right, so I know that's a little bit of historical stuff, but I hope it'll help you. <clears throat> uh, so the, the Palestinians, the point is this. The Palestinians believe that they should have a nation and a land. And they are not even a people recognized by the UN. Now you think about that. So why do they have all this conflict? They're saying, we want our land. We want to be recognized by the world as a nation. And only the side of the Arab side and that other part of the world are recognizing them as a viable group of people. The UN doesn't recognize them. The United States doesn't recognize them. And people say, well, this is one, one official said, we need to have a Palestinian state that would solve the whole problem. Can I tell you something? If you made this little spot, if you made this little spot right here, <clears throat> Palestine, and gave it a statehood, and said, okay, this is a country, Israel would never put up with that. How many of you know that? They'd never do it. So here's what's happening. <clears throat> Let's just say I'm from the South. I am from the South. <clears throat> Does the South include South Carolinas? Does it? Does it include Georgia? Does it include Florida? Does it include Louisiana? Does it include Mississippi, Alabama, Does it, North Carolina? The South includes a lot of people. Let's just say I'm a Southerner. And I say, hey, I'm a Southerner. You make me a state somewhere and call it South. I deserve a state and I'm going to fight for it. That's what the Palestinians are doing. They're saying, we're a people. You say, well, preacher, they ought to have a place. Can I tell you something? Here's what I believe. When the Antichrist comes, I believe that he's going to promise the Palestinians a state. And there don't, there's going to be peace somehow. How can he do that? There's going to be some kind of peace treaty between the, uh, army, uh, between the Antichrist and Israel and also Palestine. I can't, I'm not going to be here. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, so here's a, a little bit of history right quick. And let me just read this right quick. Read about this. The term was used to talk about Palestine. Why does self-identification by Palestinians from the start of the 20th century onwards? In the 20th century, the name was used by the British to refer to mandatory Palestine, a territory from the former Ottoman Empire, which had been divided in the uh, Sykes-Picot Agreement and secured by Britain via the mandate for Palestine obtained from the League of Nations. Starting from 2013, the term was officially used in the epo eponymous state of Palestine. Both incorporated geographic regions from the land commonly known as Palestine into a new state whose territory was named Palestine. When World War I ended in 1918 with an allied victory, the 400-year Ottoman Empire rule ended and Great Britain took control over what became known as Palestine, modern-day Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. The Balfour Declaration, that's what I'm looking for, Declaration, and the British mandate over Palestine were approved by the League of Nations in 1922. By the way, folks, I want you to know something. The League of Nations did all this stuff. That's the biggest mess I've ever seen. You know what? If I, if I was a member of the League of Nations, by the way, when the League of Nations, do you know that when the League of Nations was started, Woodrow Wilson, right? Anybody got an idea of Woodrow Wilson? I think so, but I'm not positive. When Woodrow Wilson started the League of Nations, I'm telling you what, that's the beginning of the end times because he's trying to consolidate the world into one group of people. By the way, 
one world is a sign of the end times, isn't it? So even when the League of Nations started, it was part of that. All right, I'll be done. It won't take long. Uh, Israel, uh, um, the British controlled Palestine until Israel in the years following the end of World War II became an independent state in 1947. Actually, officially it was 1948. May the 14th, right? Is that right? May the 14th, 1948, when Israel became an official nation. So, by the way, aren't you glad that England, believe it or not, the Zionist movement helped establish the country of Israel as belonging to the Jews and urged the Jews to go back and settle in their land. Folks, I don't know what you think about that, but that is something England did that I just can't hardly believe that they did. But praise God, the Lord was working. Amen? The Lord was working. Okay, I got to move on. The Declaration of Independence. Okay. Israel officially became a recognized nation in 1948. Palestine is not a country that is recognized as a sovereign state by 136 UN members. The Declaration of Independence and the Proclamation of the State of Palestine took place on November 15, 1988 in Algiers, Algeria. Since then, the objection of the Palestinian Liberation Organization had been to obtain recognition of the Palestinian state from the international community. Israel refuses to recognize the Palestinian state due to security reasons, and aren't you sure that that's reason enough? You say, preacher, what do you mean? They will not recognize them as a state because they know that they're going to try to annihilate them like they're trying to do this week. Do you know, folks, you might not be interested in all this, but I'm going to tell you something. The Lord is working all these things, and he's coming soon. He's coming soon. i got to try to finish. Uh, uh, the Palestinians or Philistines have not advanced. I, I want to make this clear. What they are doing this past week, these past several days since the 6th, has not helped the Palestinians at all. It's not helped them at all. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just about done. Listen to this. King Saul was chosen to be king of Israel. Was God really pleased with that? God said, I really want to be your head. I really want to be your king. I really want to be your ruler. I've taken care of you all these years. Why do you want a king? And they said, we want to be like the other nations. Is that right? And I tell you, even though I know it's preaching to the choir sometimes, but when we try to be like the world, it always creates a problem. It always creates a problem. So they said, let's be like other nations. We want a king like other nations. So King Saul was supposed to annihilate some people, and he didn't. He was disobedient. So we could call Saul the disobedient king of Israel. He was a basically a picture of the sinner, disobedient to God. And then we come to King David. Now, King David was a king after David's uh, God's heart, and he was obedient. Yes, he had some failures, but he was obedient, and he was a warrior, mighty king, and fought the enemy. Now, this is where... The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back as a warrior. Amen. He's coming back as a warrior. I don't know if you know about that, but when he comes back on that white horse, he's going to be a warrior. And his garments are going to be dyed in blood as he comes from Edom. Well, we'll talk about that later too. So we have the disobedient, we have the obedient king, and then we have Solomon. And then Solomon is the wise king and he brings a period of peace that's unknown. All of those kings are a type of Christ. Christ became sin for us. Saul was a sinner, basically, disobedient. Christ became sin for us. David's a man after God's own heart. He was a human, had his faults and failure. Christ became a man and took upon himself the sin of mankind and fought the battle against sin and Satan on the cross of Calvary. Thank the Lord for the warrior, Jesus Christ, and the Savior, Jesus Christ. But then there's that Solomon who's a king. He's the king of peace, and that's what's coming. Jesus Christ, when he comes a second time, He's going to be the king of peace and set up his millennial reign, which is going to be a thousand years of peace. Here's the last slide. <clears throat> I want you to just look at that a minute, and then I want to say something, and then we're done, okay? And we're done right on time. Christ, the Prince of Peace, is coming. Amen. 
Amen. Because the leaders of Israel have been disobedient, but one from the line of David, the obedient king is coming. He will subdue all enemies and a thousand year reign of peace. Listen to this statement. One contributor on Fox News from the area, from the Israel, said this, and it struck my attention really hard. He said, Israel will be larger when this war is over. What did he mean? This is a guy from Israel. He said, Israel will be larger. I'll tell you what's going to happen. They're going to get rid of Hamas out of Gaza, out of the Gaza Strip, and it will become part of Israel. You wait and see. You say, preacher, that's really going to be tough, but that's what's going to happen. Israel is going to incorporate Gaza, and they're going to rule it. Even if they have to rule it with military rule until they get rid of all of Hamas, they are not going to stand for this anymore. Gaza will become part of Israel. So here's this slide. But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. That's a promise from God. Amen? Let's pray.